This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're broadcasting from the UN Climate Summit in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. We turn now to look at the link between military spending and the climate crisis. A new report by the Transnational Institute examines how military spending and arms sales not only increase greenhouse gas emissions, but also divert financial resources and attention away from tackling the climate emergency. In a moment, we'll be joined by two co-authors of the report. But first, this is a short video produced by the Transnational Institute. My name is Muhammad. I'm a human rights lawyer, researcher, and migration activist. I have been born and raised in Egypt until I left the country in 2017 because of the risks and the threats that I faced personally because of my activism and work. When I left Egypt and became an exile, I felt like a tree that you took out of the soil. Egypt is in the international spotlight today for hosting the world's most important climate talks. But the fact that its host is the military dictator, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, it says a lot about the world's most powerful nation's real priorities. Sisi's regime survives thanks to a huge flow of oil, arms, and EU money. The richest and most polluting countries today spend 30 times as much on military as they do on climate finance for the world's most climate-affected people. Rather than providing aid, these same rich countries are interested in providing weapons and arms to countries like Egypt. And every dollar of military spending is also worsening the climate crisis. A militarized nation like Egypt and an accelerated arms race globally is the opposite of climate justice. We cannot allow my experience and the experience of many other Egyptians to become the model for how we respond to an escalating climate crisis. Climate justice requires democracy, human rights, dignity, and demilitarization. It requires a world that puts people before profits and peace before war. That's a video produced by the Transnational Institute, which has just published the new report, Climate Collateral, How Military Spending Accelerates Climate Breakdown. We are joined now by two guests. Nick Buxton is a researcher at the Transnational Institute, joining us from Wales. And Mohamed Akashif is an attorney and migration activist living in Germany. Nick, let's begin with you. Um, why don't you lay out the findings of your report that looks into military spending, arms and weapons sales from the world's richest nations and the deep impacts that um, it has on countries' capacity to address the climate catastrophe that the world is facing right now? Yes, thanks, Amy. Thanks for the invitation to be on your show. Um, this report, as you know, is, is coming on the back of big discussions at this COP, which we just heard about in this earlier section, uh, about the need uh, that the poorest countries who are most impacted by climate change are saying that we need finance to both adapt to climate change and to deal with the loss and damage. And, and we hear uh, John Kerry, you were just quoting the earlier clip, saying, name me a nation that has trillions of dollars to deal with this except basically saying washing his hands of the situation and refusing uh, to accept some responsibility. And yet what this report shows is that there is trillions of dollars. Um, the richest countries, which are called Annex II countries under the UN Climate Talks, um, have dedicated $9.45 trillion to military spending in the last eight years, between 2013 and 2021. Uh, and that is 30 times more than they have dedicated to climate finance. And they're still not delivering on their promises to deliver the 100 billion a year uh, that was promised way back in 2009 now. Um, so, so what we're seeing firstly in this report is that there is resources, but it's been dedicated to military spending. Uh, the second main finding is that of this military spending, it is very much tied to a very high um, emitting 
uh, uh, situation that we're creating greenhouse gases with every dollar we spend on the military. And that's because the military depends uh, with its jets, its tanks, its ships on high levels of use of fossil fuels. Uh, so, for example, the F-35 jet, which is the main fighter jet that the U.S. is now deploying, uses 5,600 gallons of liters an hour um, in, in, its, in, in its deployment. So these, and these, and these uh, weapons which are bought then are, are usually in operation for 30 years, so it's locking in that carbon for a long time to come. So we're creating a situation where actually the military is contributing deeply to the crisis. Um, and then the third main finding of the report uh, was was looking at what the richest countries, the Annex II countries, are doing in terms of arms sales. And we actually found out found that the richest countries are supplying arms to all 40 of the most climate vulnerable countries. So what we're seeing is we're not providing the finance that we need for the poorest countries, but we are providing arms. And in a situation of climate instability uh, and in terms of uh, a real poverty, and people really facing uh, on the front lines of climate change, uh, we're actually adding fuel to the fire by providing the arms that could lead to conflict. And is, as, as the video shared, is the complete opposite of climate justice. Can you talk about the armed forces and fuel consumption, Nick? Yeah, there's a, a report just came out actually just a couple of days ago, which has been estimating how much uh, the military uh, contribute towards emissions. Uh, so, and it calculates that uh, the world's military uh, contribute 5.5% of the total emissions, um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if it was considered a country, it would actually come fourth. So it's, it's, just, bef it's just after Russia in terms of how much uh, emissions that they produce. So it's it's a very substantial pro contribution to the problem. Uh, the Pentagon in the US is the single largest institutional emitter of uh, carbon emissions. Um, and, uh, and the 5.5%, for example, is double what is produced by civil aviation. And what is what is really shocking is that within within the UN system, it is not properly counted. So it's one of the few uh, bodies and organ organs that doesn't have to report all its emissions to the UNFCC and the IPCC. And that was because the US, uh, under the Bill Clinton administration, actually carved out an exemption for the Pentagon. Uh, so at the moment, that exemption, in 2015, it was watered down, so now they can report it, but it's not, it's still voluntary. And we still have a very incomplete picture of actually how many emissions are produced. Uh, so this is one of the key demands that's also been raised at the COP is that, it, we, we're doing some estimates that it's a really significant player, um, but it's absolutely crucial that it becomes um, mandatory for the military to provide it and to show all their emissions, not just the emissions of their equipment, but also the supply chains of the arms sales and so on, because uh, we do know that these systems are very highly intensive uh, users of fossil fuels, and are also very much embedded in a system that has been protecting the fossil fuel economy globally for a long time. I want to bring Mohammed El Kashef into this conversation. Um, Mohammed, Egypt is the third largest importer of weapons in the world. Um, one of dozens of countries that has received more and more military aid, arms, and weapons from the United States, from the European Union, uh, as well as from other rich nations. How has this contributed not only to the worsening pollution and the impacts of the climate crisis in the country uh, and the world, but also to serious human rights violations committed in Egypt by the Egyptian military? Yes, thank you. Um, actually, Egypt uh, has spent nearly $50 billion on precautions weapons since 2014, just soon after the military returned to the power uh, in 2013. And since 2017, it has been one of the top five arms importing countries. In the last three years, it's ranked as the third, highest third. And actually, uh, in, in two major deals, Egypt paid around 5.2 billion 
euros in 2015 and 4.2 billion euros in 2021. As we all see, and it's it's not hidden, uh, the economical situation that Egypt is uh, facing and the suffer uh, in that uh, Egyptian people uh, see and struggle with since 2016. But also, when we talk about the human rights situation and we talking about the situation inside the country itself, uh, this country kind of shaped and controlled by every level by the military, which not only uh, the, the every level of a state bureaucracy, but also controls large sector of the economy and, this, and the open spaces. Um, I'm sure now, like COP27 just shed in the light uh, on, the, on Egypt, and uh, luckily there is a civic space that the human rights defender, the people still living in Egypt, can speak loudly and transfer this, their voices to the outer world. Unfortunately, this arms deals and all this money involved give the Egypt and the Egyptian state kind of legitimacy and international support that give them the power to crack down on the civil society, to keep over 60,000, referring to Amnesty report in 2016, more than 60,000 political prisoners and detained. We see actually just one figure, Ala Abdel Fattah, just one figure, just one political prisoner who got a support and who is just lucky to have some people talking for him. And we see how the Egyptian state actually respond to such demands. So that's what we are seeing, actually. The world and the European member states, the USA and even the Russia, all of them just closing the eyes of the violations happen inside Egypt because of all these deals, because of the interest. So, Kashif, if you could, if you could talk more about where we are right now, um, where we are. You're in Germany. We're in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. Um, and about what this place sort of represents. For many, they don't even have a sense that they're in Egypt. It is such a different place, so isolated. Actually, Egypt is not isolated. Egypt is in the middle of everything, like in the middle, middle of, of East. It's, I meant Sharm el Sheikh. Yeah, Sharm el Sheikh actually is a really nice touristic resort. This does not reflect the real situation in Egypt, in Delta, in Cairo, in Alexandria, and North Coast. Sharm el Sheikh is just a part of heaven if we want to discuss that. And actually, uh, it's crazy because it, there is no transparency, no democratic uh, accountable or process holding the Egyptian state the responsibility for what happened to invite all these people to Sharm el Sheikh and uh, let them enjoy their time in such a resort. I would say this is just not just a greenwashing, but also this is a big lie. Mm. You also are a major advocate for refugees. Can you talk about climate refugees, uh, the same rich nations that are creating conditions that cause people to flee, investing then billions of dollars in militaries and borders and preventing them from coming to the fossil fuel-emitting nations? Yeah, sure. Actually, when we see that, it's, it's a kind of a closed circle and we are going in dilemma. Uh, big states are expending more money and expending uh, too much billion dollars and euros in, in the arm, and then we see the military emission and how it uh, affect on the climate, and find like displaced people and refugees are leaving their home and their countries to find a better place to live, to find uh, some place still <clears throat> uh, livable. In, in a sense, and then in a state actually of spending money and spending resources to correct the situation and to face the crisis, no, 
the states are spending more and more money in militarization, in the militarization, in militarizing the border, in the border security. And that's actually really sad because we see that uh, the crisis is kind of uh, affecting us all. And we need really to find a solution, to find a better solution. What we see in Africa now, it's also going to Medi Mediterranean, because in the Mediterranean, big sector of fishermen, big sector of communities are losing their source of finalizing and affording living. And we are, what we are witnessing actually in Pakistan and the floods in Pakistan and what's happening, this, this is all actually kind of impact of our wrong policies. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us. We're certainly going to link to your report. Mohammed al Khashef is an attorney and migration activist speaking to us from Germany. Nick Buxton, researcher at the Transnational Institute. They are co-authors of Climate Collateral, How Military Spending Accelerates Climate Breakdown. Um, also uh, co-author of The Secure and the Dispossessed, How the Military and Corporations Are Shaping a Climate-Changed World. Next up, we look at the movement to stop a major oil pipeline in East Africa stretching from Uganda to Tanzania. It's called ECOP. Back in 30 seconds. <laughs> 